Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In our last lesson of tafsir through the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we looked at the different methods that was employed by the Quraysh to stop the Muslims making hijrah, migrating to al Medina. And we said they employed four different methods. The first of those was at tafriqu bain al rajul wa zawjatihi wa waladihi to separate a man from his wife and child. The second methodology or method that they employed after that was what? Is kidnapping or forced rendition that they'll actually go all the way to Medina and rendition back, back to where? To Mecca. The third method was forced imprisonment along with torture. And the fourth was tajreed min al mal to freeze or to seize their assets. Despite all these different methods that was employed by the Quraysh, we mentioned last week that every single person, they left Mecca. From the Muslims, the only ones that remained were the Mustad'afeen, the weak, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr and Ali. Now why did Abu Bakr and Ali stay? Because they were not from the Mustad'afeen. It was because they were ordered to stay by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So everyone that could leave, they left, and they left secretly. The only person that did not leave secret, which we didn't mention last week, was who? Hijrah of Umar. Everybody's Hijrah was different. Everybody's Islam was different. Except, was the same, I'm sorry, except for the Hijrah of Umar and the Islam of Umar. When it, Umar an, was making Hijrah, he actually announced to them and he went to them, I am leaving. Whoever wants his children to become orphans and his wife to become a widow, please follow me. And one of them followed him. And that happened to him. His wife became a widow. Umar, even when he accepted Islam, he was one of the first to go and openly proclaim his Islam. Because people used to accept Islam and they used to keep it secret and worship secretly. But Umar radiallahu an, when he accepted Islam, I forgot the name of this individual, Umar radiallahu an, he went to this person and told him, I've become a Muslim. This person was known reputably not to be able to keep a secret. The Arabs would say he couldn't hold water in his mouth. As soon as Umar told him, I've become a Muslim, it was like BBC, Twitter, Facebook, he started to pray. Umar Saba'a, Umar Saba'a, Umar's accepted Islam. And Umar was following him around everywhere, said, La, bel aslam tu. No, I've become a Muslim. Because Saba'a was a derogatory term. So, despite all the efforts of the Quraysh, everybody left Mecca, illa al Afid, except for the weak or those that were ordered to stay by the Prophet. What we're going to be looking at today, inshaAllah ta'ala, is as for those that became from the Muhajireen, those who migrated to Medina. What they found what they got in Medina, when they got to Medina, from the hospitality of the people of Medina, from the care, the solidarity that the Muslims of Medina showed them, that due to them showing this hospitality, this care, solidarity, they became known as Al Ansar, the helpers, what they showed the Muhajireen. When we look at the mannerism which what they received and how they were embraced, after that, we're going to look at the different household and the different family that hosted the Muhajireen, the names of these families and the names of the Muhajireen that they hosted. Thirdly, we're going to look at this community, how they chose a leader for this community. Because the Quraysh or the people from Mecca themselves, they were different tribes. And in Medina as well, they had diverse tribes. So the tribes were very diverse. How they managed to choose a leader, a single leader from amongst them, and this is before the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Because in the modern time we're living in today, when it comes to selecting leaders, or presidents, or prime ministers, we find there's a lot of issues. Because nowadays, when people select leaders, it's either along a what? A tribal line, nationalistic line. But here you're dealing with so many tribes, people from different places, but unanimously they chose one leader from amongst them. Lastly, or fourthly, we're going to look at how the Hijrah to Medina compared to the Hijrah to where? Abyssinia. 
And lastly, why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this is very important, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him to choose Medina as a place of hijrah. So first and foremost, what the muhajirun, the people of Mecca that migrated from the Muslims, what they found when they got to Medina, Jayyid. They found strong brotherhood from the Al-Ansar. And how did they find this strong brotherhood from the Ansar? When the Muhajirun went to Medina, majority of them, they left and they had no houses in Medina. They left their wealth behind. They had absolutely nothing. How did the Ansar receive them? Did they build for them camps, specific places for refugees? Did they have distribution center where they'll go and give them food or donate food to them? No. No refugee camps, no place for displaced people, but rather they welcomed them into their own homes. So there's no refugee camps. There's no such thing as, look, these people that are displaced will build a special designated place for these Muhajiri. La, you're coming into our houses. Did they have a distribution center to give them food? No, there's no such thing as us distributing food to you. Whatever we eat, you eat. Whenever we eat, you eat. They found this with the Ansar. Unlike what we see today sometimes, that these people are placed in a certain area or they're given a certain type of food. The Muhajirun, they welcome them into their houses immediately. And welcome them to their houses, you have to understand, you're not welcoming an individual into your house. The Muhajirun, they left with who? With their families. So if Abu Rayyan, he came to me and I'm Ansar, I'm not just welcoming Abu Rayyan, him and Rayyana and his wife. Not only him, Rayyana and his wife, the Muhajirun, they'll bring their in-laws with them. They'll bring their tribe with them. So you find one single family, a family house, started to house families. And not only families, they started to house tribes. Because I will not only bring Abu Rayyana, I bring Abu Abdullah from a different tribe. Abu Abdullah again, a different tribe. Abu Amatillah, a different tribe. Different families, different tribes in a single household. And this hospitality is not an issue. You know what? When things settle for you in a few days, move on. They stay there for as long as they needed to stay there for. Months on end. And they were part and parcel of their daily lives. Imagine that having not a single person but families and tribes in a house that was just your house, living with you for extended period of time. They eat what you eat, they share everything in the house with you. And you know, if you go to Medina, if you look back in those days, how the houses were built. It wasn't like, oh, we've got a guest quarter. It's not like we've got rooms, you know, with ensuite bath bathrooms, that you had your own bathroom. No, they shared everything in those houses. So they found this from the Muhajirun from the Ansar. And what made the Ansar like this? What made the Ansar like this is how they viewed the Muhajirun, those who came to them and emigrated to them. Their perception and their view of the Muhajirun. How did they view them? How did they perceive them? The Ansar did not perceive themselves first and foremost as being the only one that sacrificed in terms of their houses, their wealth, and their services. They saw the Muhajirun as the examples. They saw the Muhajirun as the model of sacrifice, of wealth, of housing, of stability above them. Why did they see them as the example? They didn't see them as beggars. Because they knew these people that made hijrah, that migrated to us, they left everything behind for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they did not view them as beggars. They did not view them as people in need. They saw them that no matter how generous we are to them, no matter how much we give up, these people have given up a lot more. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them in the Quran. Allah Ta'ala says, for those fuqara, those poor ones, impoverished ones that migrated and they were taken out of their houses and their wealth was forcibly taken from them. 
that they did all of this yabtaguna fadla min Allah seeking the bounty of Allah wa ridwana and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they left they gave up everything and after giving up everything and they got to Medina wa yansurun Allah wa rasulah it was an end they still continue to aid Allah's religion and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah ta'ala says ulaika humus sadiqun these are the truthful ones so the muhajirun saw in them sidq truthfulness just like today when we see refugee crisis where Muslims are forced to leave their countries because they're being persecuted we should see them in the same manner that these people in the same way we have houses they had houses they had wealth they had property and they're sadiqun because it is easy to stay in those countries and just give up your faith say I'm not a Muslim I am not a Muslim for them to have fleed is because they held not to their faith it's easy to say you know what I'm no longer a Muslim but they left and they fled with their faith and in some of these refugee camps you find uh, halaqat circles of tahfiz of Quran they fled with their faith this is how we should view them how the Ansar they view these people also we want to look at how as diverse as these communities was in terms of tribes, in terms of families, some from Mecca, some from Medina, how they may need to choose a leader from amongst them. Because to have a community that's cohesive, cooperative, you need to have a leader. So on what basis did they choose a leader? What was their skill for choosing a leader? Their skill for choosing a leader or choosing the best amongst them is a saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we've made you shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu. We've made you tribes and nations. To know each other. Inna akramakum inda Allahi atqaqum. The best of you in the sight of Allah, the one that has the most taqwa. That was their criteria. Not that it's from this tribe. Not it's from that tribe. Their criteria, the one that had the most taqwa from amongst us, is the best of us. The other criteria for choosing a leader, for the muhajirun, because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had not made hijrah, but they needed an imam, somebody to lead them in salah. They needed a community leader. And last week or two weeks ago, we mentioned the name of the first Imam that will receive them in Quba, the leader of the Muslims, the Imam of the Muslim. And what was his name? His name was Salim Mawla Abi Hudayfa. His name was Salim. Mawla in Arabic means a freed slave. So it was a free slave of Abu Hudayfa. Now, why did they select Salim, Mawla Abu Hudayfa, as their leader? Being is not from the aristocrats of Mecca, it's not from Quraysh, nor is from Aus, nor is it from Khazraj. And when it comes to social standing, he didn't have the highest social standing. He's a free slave. Why did they choose Salim, Mawla Abu Hudayfa? Because at that time, he's the one that had memorized the most Quran from amongst them. This was the way of the Sahaba, that the one that has the most Quran is the best amongst us even when it came to battles the one that memorized the most quran when they killed from the shuhada the martyrs they bury him first and those who came after them like umar they would choose the one that's memorized the most in the book of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the prophet said man ta -quran wa the best of you is the one who learned the quran and teaches the quran but learn the quran just not memorization implementation understanding applying the rules and the regulation this was their leader the one that had the most Qur'an. And if you look in the past of Muslim countries, Nigeria included, it was like a must, especially in highly densely populated area of the Muslims, that the first thing they would do before going to school is to memorize the Qur'an. Always. You go to many places, even northern Nigeria today, people memorize the Qur'an first. And those people that have memorized the Qur'an, even when it came to secular studies, they're number one. They are number one in secular studies. So we should be the same, that the best amongst you is the one that's memorized, implements the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should encourage our children like this. Because how many a times do you go to this social gathering? Abu Abdurrahman, Sheikh Saeed introduces his son. This is my son, Abdurrahman. MashaAllah. What does he do? He's a, MashaAllah. This is my other son, Muhammad. He's an engine. MashaAllah. This is my son. He's, and this is my other son, is a half of the Quran. Hardly anything. And this is the best. So they chose the one that memorized the most Quran from amongst them. Now, they knew it was going to be the leader because in war, likewise, 
the one that holds the flag of La ilaha Muhammad Rasulullah in war, or the flags of the different tribes is always the who? The Hafidh al-Quran, or the one that knows the most Quran. And so it was that Salim, Mawla Abi Hudayfa, when it came to the battle of Yamama, the person that was holding the flag of Harb, of what was who? Salim, Mawla Abi Hudayfa. And that flag is what keeps up the people's what? The spirit of the Muslims, so long as that flag is raised, people are continuing to fight. So that battle of Yamama was extremely severe. And his slogan that day, Salim Mawla Abi Hudayfa, what he was saying all the time was, Bit Sahamil al Quran Ana. What a wretched carrier or memorizer of the Quran, memorizer of the Quran I am, in Farar too, if I flee from this battle. So not just memorizing, application. If I was to flee this battle, what a wretched person I am. And he held that flag up with the right hand until they took off his right hand. And when they took off the right hand, he held it with his left hand. When they cut off his left hand, whatever remained from his arm, he held it until they stabbed him in the chest with a spear. And he passed away shaheedan, inshallah. So Mawla Abi Hudayfa was the Imam of the Muhajireen and the Ansar. So this was the criteria. Fifthly, when we look at the Hijrah to Habash or Abyssinia, Al Habasha, compared to the Hijrah to Medina, we find that the Hurriya, the freedom of da'wah in Medina was more because Dawla Islamiyya, Mujtama al Islami, and this is a lesson for the time we're living in today. The Abyssinia was a perfect place for religious refuge because they're being persecuted in Mecca. It was a, it was a perfect place for political refuge in the same way today that people may flee from certain countries will go to western countries and it's a perfect refuge even politically people go to the western countries and to a certain extent they give you your rights these western countries but fleeing to those countries if you have the option to flee to a muslim countries are they comparable not comparable because no matter what to a certain extent you're still isolated from the rest of the society and no matter what they claim from religious freedom you're still bound dead in certain things don't believe the hype about this religious freedom. You're still limited. Whereas in Muslim countries, there's certain limitations that are not there. Whatever those things are from the Sharia, that part and parcel of their constitution is that these things are permissible in our country. When it comes to religious freedom, certain things are not limited in the Muslim countries. Even these other countries that may give you refuge. So you find also the effect you're able to affect the community more. Yes, in Habasha, they affected the community, but affecting a community in a non-Muslim country is not like affecting a community in a Muslim country. As an example, on my recent visit, if I had the time, if I had the resources, I could build like a hundred madrasa, alatul, no restriction, nothing, because it's predominantly a Muslim country. I could affect changes, they're easier than a country in the West, even the best of them that give rights to the Muslim, I could do a lot more in those countries. So when it came to Medina, because it's an Islamic environment, they were able to effect a lot more changes. And also, certain parts of Africa. You find in England, when we used to be on the Dawah table, people take Shahada, one, two, three, many. But in Africa, you're dealing with villages of people taking Shahada. Villages of people, a whole village. So the environment of Medina, they had more effect and the Hurriya of Dawah was a lot better. So now, fifthly, we want to look at why did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, why did Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala make him choose al Medina? They say, Asrar for secrets or reason, La ya'lamuha illallah, no one knows it, but Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and also to honor the people of Medina. However, there are some reasons that we know. From amongst those reasons is the strategic location, geographical location of Medina. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if we look back to the tribe that said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we'll protect you, we'll give you security, and they were ready. They said, but we have an issue. We are surrounded from one angle by who? By the Persians. By the Persians. And we have an allegiance with them, not to bring any innovation, any new religion. So therefore, they could not guarantee from one angle geographically to protect Islam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could not accept it from them. But later on it became Muslim. He couldn't accept it from them. So Medina strategically 
geographically was in an ideal location. Because Medina, there's an area called Al-Hurra, Al-Waqib, Al-Hurra, Al-Wabra. Al-Hurra, Al-Wabra is on the western side of Medina. These are like volcanic lavas that are formed into solid rocks that till today, 2019, you cannot penetrate that area. No force, no army. The way you organize an army, you organize a formation to encroach upon a country, you can't enter it. It's protected. From western Medina, Nukampa is very, very rough ter terrain. And then on the, from eastern Medina, no, west. From west, you have Al-Waqim, the same thing. So from the east, from the west, you can't enter. The surrounding parts of Medina is surrounded by what? What do you always see when you enter Medina? Palm trees. Trees and palm trees. You could not penetrate Medina. The only place that was exposed to Medina is where? The north. And that's why in the Battle of Khandaq, the fortress which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam built was from where? The north. That's why Medina it has, a, it has al hisn al tabii even if you go to Wikipedia, they will tell you it has a natural defense, a natural fortress that's been placed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So strategically, Medina was what? Ideal for defending the Muslims. Secondly, other than the geographical relationship, in my journeys they say, people make a place. Your like and dislike of a place is usually based on the what? The people. You could have the best ACs, you could have the most... I don't know, luxurious, comfortable thing in a country. But if the people are horrible, you're not going to like it very much. People make a place. So not only did they have this geographically, it was said, Ahlul Medina. The people of Medina, Min al awsi wal khazraj, ashabu nakhwa. They were people of customs and principles. Wal wa iba, wa izza, an honor. Wa furusiya, and they were known to be horsemen, knights, that would fight with their horses in battle. Wa quwa, wa shakima. And they were people of courage. They had a very strong heart. And people that believed in freedom, they never put themselves down to anybody. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam choose Medina. Likewise, like we mentioned time and time again in lessons, tribal allegiance, tribal allegiance, it plays a massive part with the Arabs, especially blood allegiance. So these things, although the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they were not choosing things along tribal lines. But there's the Sunnah of the Prophet sallam, and the Sunnah of what? Sunnah al kawniyah universal laws. You have to work with both so long as it doesn't contradict the Sunnah of the Prophet sallam, to the advantage of Islam. So tribal uh, allegiance, universal law, racial allegiance, yeah, sorry, racial allegiance, nationalistic allegiance, according to universal law, is something that exists. Like I say time and time again, you know, if you go to Nigeria, for example, anywhere in Africa, getting a passport, subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not like England. England, from Qatar, put it in the post, poop, poop, DHL is here. There it is difficult. But it is difficult depending on who you know. Depending on your last name. It's true. I found this on my travel to Nigeria, that... Just by your last name or with your uncle is with your father. Hello tool. You could get it. You get a passport in one hour. In one hour. You could get a drive license while sitting in your house. Like it came out of a box of cornflakes. You know you get the toys in the box of cornflakes. Like that. Just like that. So this tribal allegiance is something from the Arabs along bloodline. Along bloodline. Where was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from? Mecca. But his uncles were who? His uncles were from Medina. How is this? The uncles of the Prophet وسلم, from Medina. They were from Bani Adi ibn Najjar. They were his uncles. How were their uncles of the Prophet وسلم? They were the uncles of the Prophet وسلم, because Ummu Abdul Muttalib. Who's Abdul Muttalib? The grandfather of the Prophet. So, Ummu Abdul Muttalib, the mother of the grandfather of the Prophet وسلم, was from Bani Adi, was from their women. She was from this tribe. The grandfather of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. These are his what uncles, maternal uncles, because of the grandmother. J. These were the maternal uncles of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. As for his grandfather, sorry, as for Hashim, who married the mother of Abdul Muttalib, 
who is the great grandfather of Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he married there and he left Abdul Muttalib where in Medina. So as far as they're concerned, Abdul Muttalib is what from Medina and his grandfather the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the uncles of the Prophet sallallahu from Bani Adi, Bani Adi. So Abdul Muttalib grew up in Medina until one day one of the uncles, one of the uncles went to Medina. And he realized his brother had married there and he left a child there. And what was the name of the uncle? Muttalib. So Muttalib, because the son belongs to the who? The father, the tribe of the father. So I'm taking him back to where with me? To Mecca. And they agreed for him to go. So that's how Muttalib, he ended up where? In Mecca. Abdul Muttalib, I'm sorry. He went with his uncle Muttalib. So when he entered Mecca, when he entered Mecca with his uncle, the people don't know him. So they say, Hada Muttalib. This is Muttalib. And this boy behind him, maybe and probably is Abdul Muttalib, the servant of Muttalib. So from that day, he became known as Abdul Muttalib. But his name is not Abdul Muttalib. But because he thought it was a Abdul Muttalib, and he was cursing them, they were saying, ta if it, This is my nephew. But they didn't stop. Once a name was stuck to you, khalas, Abdul Muttalib, he stuck to him. But his real name was what? Shayba. Because when he was born, Shayba means an old man. When he was born, he had some white. Some people naturally, even before they ate, had white in their hair. He had white in his hair. So his name was Shayba. So every name he got was like a nickname that became a name. So his name was Shayba, then Abdul Muttalib. So these were the uncles of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They're bound to protect him. That is one of our own. This is our nephew. So Allah subhanahu wa taala made the Prophet some choose Medina for this reason. Also, the two major tribes of the Arabs, or all Arabs, they go back to two lineages: Qahtan wal Adnan. The Aws and the Khazraj were from Qahtan, and the Quraysh were from what? Adnan. So two of the strongest lineages of Arabs that came together. Al-Adnan wal Qahtan. Jayyid? Now the other reasons the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inspired him to take Medina. That we find Medina, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inspired the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to take Medina. Why Medina holds a special place or held a special place in Allah's Sahaba, it knows a special place in our heart today. Firstly, Mahabbatuhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he loved al Medina upon reaching Medina. Because everything we talked about so far is the hijrah before the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reached Medina, the dua he made for Medina. These are from the excellences of Medina. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam da'a Nabi rabbahu qailan. He called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma habbib inayl al-Medina kahubbina Mecca aw ashad. O oh Allah, make Medina become so beloved to us. The same way Mecca is beloved to us, aw ashad, or even more than Mecca. This was from the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After this dua, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, idha qadima min safarin fa absara ila darajat aw إلى جدرات يعني جمع جدران المدينة أوضع ناقته. That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, whenever he came back from a journey and he saw or he began to see the walls of Medina, أضع ناقت حركها. It will cause it to go even faster. وإن كان دابة and if it was a riding animal, حركها. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would speak towards Medina. قال عبد الله he said, Abdullah ibn al-Harith harrakaha. The Prophet ﷺ make it go faster. Why? Min ajli hubbihi laha. Due to the love of the Prophet ﷺ for Medina. As soon as he sees Medina, he will pick up his face to rush into Medina. Secondly, the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bidi'fi ma fi Mecca min al-baraka. The Prophet ﷺ prayed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he multiplies the blessings of Medina. More than Mecca. In a hadith, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhi said, كان الناس إذا رأوا أول الثمر When the people, they will see the first harvest. جاءوا به إلى النبي They will come to the Prophet sallallahu anhi sallam with these fruits. وبارك لنا في صاعنا And 
He will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us in our measurement, metric, and volume measures of our fruits. Allahumma. And then the Prophet sallallahu will say, after say, Allahumma barik lana fi muddina wa sa'ina. The Prophet sallallahu will say, Allahumma inna Ibrahim abduka wa khalilu. Oh Allah. Verily, Ibrahim alayhi salam was your servant and the one beloved to you. Wa nabiyyuka and he was your prophet. Wa inni and I am also Abduka wa nabiyuk, I am your servant and I am your prophet. Wa innahu da'a da'aka li Makkah and he prayed to you Ibrahim, he invoked you for Makkah. Wa inni ad'uka lil Madina. As for me, I'm praying and making dua to you for Medina. Bimithli ma da'aka bi Makkah. For the same thing he asked you for Makkah, I'm asking you the same thing for Medina. And what was the dua of Ibrahim for Makkah? What's the dua of Ibrahim from the Quran, Surah Al Baqarah? Uh huh. Mutma'innan. Uh huh. Rabbij al hadha baladan aminan mutma'innan. Uh huh. Sahih. It is. War. War zuk. Ahlahu. And provide. For the people of that place, minathamarati, from fruits and harvest. This was the dua of Ibrahim for Makkah. So the Prophet said, I make the dua, same dua for you. Wa mitluhu ma'ahu. Along with that, he prayed more than that, along with it. So the Prophet wasallam prayed for the barakah of Medina to be multiplied over Makkah. Ismatuha min ad dajjal Makkah is protected from Dajjal wa Ta'un and from plagues. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed, and we have to believe in this, ghayr, over Medina, Malaika that protects Medina from Dajjal. فَلَا يَسْتَطِيعُ Dajjal إِلَيْهَا السَّبِيلَ That's not one of the few places Dajjal will not be able to enter. Because the angels guarding Medina. Also the Kuffar wal Munafiqeen. Because from the du'a of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he used to ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to protect it also from plagues. Fadil al-sabr ala shiddatiha. Living in Medina may not be easy. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he mentioned the excellence of living in Medina, even if you're living in hardship. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in hadith of Sa'ad ibn Abu Waqas radiyallahu an, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Al-Badina khayrun lahum law kanu ya'lamun Medina is better for them if they bought new So many of the Sahaba they always wanted to die in Medina La yada'aha ahadun raghbatan anna illa abdalallahu fiha man huwa khayrun minhu Nobody, nobody leaves Medina because he doesn't want to be in Medina goes to someone else except Allah will put someone better than him there in Medina And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went on to say and nobody is patient upon the hardship, the difficulty of Medina, illa except kuntu lahu shafi'an. Except I will intercede for him yawm qiyamah. Wa kuntu lahu shaheedan. And I'll be a witness for him yawm qiyamah. If you're patient upon the hardship of Medina. How many of us, subhanAllah, that was in Saudi before wished we knew these ahadith before we left Saudi? We never have left Saudi. We will have stayed in Medina. That the Prophet will be a shafi' for you, Yawm Qiyamah, be a shaheed. Even if the contracts are less, even if the wages are less, the Prophet will be a shafi' for you, Yawm Qiyamah. Also, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Fadil al-Sabr, consider the patience of uh, being patient in Medina. Afwan, the excellence of dying in Medina. Umar radiallahu an, qal, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man istata'a an yamuta bil Medina fal yamut. فَإِنِّي أَشْفَعُ لِمَنْ يَمُوتُ بِهَا That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He mentioned That whoever is able to pass away in Medina Let him do so For very little intercede for him يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Also they said Medina is the كَحْفُ الْإِيمَانِ كَحْفُ الْإِيمَانِ It's the كَحْف What's كَحْف again? The cave Or the place Iman It is protected And also Filth and bad behaviours is removed from Medina. And first and foremost about dying in Medina, we find many of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they used to pray to die in Medina. For amongst them was who? Umar radiallahu anhu. 
That is to say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah marzuqni shahadatan fi sabili. Oh Allah, give me shahada in your path. Make me become a martyr. Waj'al mawti fi baladi rasulillah. And make my death be in the land of the Prophet sallam, Medina. Kahful iman. In a hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned to her, al-iman yalja'u ilayha ma ma daqat bihi al-bilad. That iman, it flees and seeks refuge in where it flees in Medina. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, inna al-iman ya'riz ila al-Medina. Iman, it flees to Medina in the same way ta'rizu al-hayya ila juhriha. The same way the snake, it runs into his what? In his hole. Iman, he goes to Medina. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ لَا يَخْرُجُ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدٌ By the one that my, ha- my soul is in his hand. Nobody leaves Medina, no one to be there, except Allah will put someone who is better than him there. He said Medina is like a utensil or appliance. تُخْرِجُ الْخَبَثِ it takes out the bad things from it. It takes out the bad things from it. طيب. Th- uh, seventhly, from the Fadil of Medina, that it wipes out sins and burdens. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Innaha tayyibatun tanfi al It wipes out and negates sins. Kama tanfi al nar khabath al fidda. In the same way that fire removes the stain upon silver. حفظها الله تعالى إياها ممن يريدها بالسوء. Allah subhanahu wa taala has protected it from whatever wants to do evil in Medina. So Allah taala protected it from whoever wants to do evil in Medina. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam tawaada. He threatened. He said, "Man ahdatha." فيها حدثا أو أو فيها محدثا أو أخاف أهلها سبحان الله بلعنة الله وعذابه وبالهلاك العاجل. The Prophet Sallam has threatened the one that does an innovation in Medina. And last week we were talking about the evil of what innovation in the Deen of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala the khutbah. So innovation is not an easy affair. He said whoever أَحْدَثَ فِيهَا حَدَثًا brings an innovation in Medina أو أَوَ فِيهَا مُحْدِثًا أو gives refuge to a person of innovation a person of bid'a in Medina أو أَخَافَ أَهْلَهَا or cause the people of Medina to become scared like the terrorist action that happened in Medina when someone near the haram it made an explosive go off whoever does this the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has threatened with the dua بِاللَّعْنَةِ الله, the curse of Allah the punishment of Allah and destruction. In a hadith of Abu Sa'id Al Khudri radiallahu an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Nobody yakidu bi ahli al Medina. Nobody threatens or plots against the, same, against the people of Medina except it would dissolve in the same way that salt dissolves in water. Medina is a very, very, very sacred place, which leads to the last point, which is Tahrimuha. Tahrimu al Medina, the sacredness or sanctity of Medina. The Prophet is prohibited with wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that blood is not allowed to be split on Medina, and weapon is not allowed to be carried in Medina, and nobody plants in Medina, nobody cuts from the trees of Medina and so on and so forth of the things which are haram to do in Mecca. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in hadith, inna Ibrahim harrama Mecca wa da'a laha. Ibrahim made Mecca haraman, yani sacred, and made dua for it. Wa harramtu al-Madinata, and I have made Mecca sacred. Kama harrama Ibrahimu Mecca. And the same way that Ibrahim made Mecca become haram, this also sacred. وَدَعَوْتُ لَهَا فِي مُدِّهَا وَصَاعِهَا مِثْلُ مَا دَعَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ And I pray for Allah Ta'ala to bless whatever comes out from the land in Medina, the same way Ibrahim prayed for Mecca. So the sacredness of Medina. وَإِنَّ هَذِهِ الْفَضَائِ الْعَظِيمَةِ 
you know, these excellences of Medina uh, Azimah, the great, which made the Sahaba radiallahu anhum hold on to Medina and were eager in making hijrah to Medina. So these excellences of Medina. The last part of the seerah that remains from this book, not of the seerah that we need to move on to next, is the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Medina. But we could not do so till we finish the ayat al makiya the Meccan verses, insha'Allah ta'ala. So we plan and continue, we plan, I don't know what the permission will be like here, to continue the classes in Ramadan of ayat al makiya insha'Allah. And then after that, move on to the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu and look at the ayat al madaniya So if we have, a, we have a class next week, insha'Allah, Ramadan, Mata Yakun. Juma'a. Is this the last Juma'a before Ramadan? One more Juma'a. So we have a class of tafsir next week, insha'Allah. And uh, we'll see what happens uh, during Ramadan, insha'Allah. Subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, ashadu an la ilaha,